to Nuked Radio. This is episode 31. Today is Tuesday, May 15th, 2012. I'm your host, Christina Consolo. With me today is Jules and Kurt from Room 101 on Orion. We finally heard from Michio Kaku, and Jules and I have been saying for months, you know, where is he? How come he's not coming out and talking about Fukushima? The last time we saw him was at the beginning of the disaster. He went on Letterman and talked about it, and he went on CNN a bunch of times and talked about it. He said that they've lied to us. He made some very strong statements. Well, he came out this past weekend. He did an interview, uh, which we are going to play a portion of a little bit later in the show. And what he was basically telling us is that we have another first from TEPCO. Never before seen in the history of nuclear power, we have liquefied uranium ore. And we're going to talk about what exactly that means and how that changes the perspective of what's going on at the plants. There were a couple other news stories, too, that we wanted to go over. This one was posted. This is the top story in any news this morning. A physician asking the question, did Japan raise radiation limits, where you could insert U.S. there, too, to keep people calm while they're being poisoned? There's a four-part video from a Dr. Bradford Weeks. As a medical doctor, I'd want the government to tell me, is it based on a new discovery or is it to keep people calm while they are poisoned? I have not had a chance to watch all four segments of this, but it's the uh, top story on any news right now if you want to check it out. Jules had some interesting nuclear news in her area of the country, and we talked about this last night on WTF, secret nuclear reactor with weapons-grade uranium in Kodak's basement. And I wanted to bring this story up again because I thought it was pretty shocking. And, you know, Christina, I actually saw that it did hit our local uh, newspaper. Somebody posted it this morning. So interesting. It was broken first on alternative media. This is like the main Kodak lab that's located in Rochester, New York. And this article says, while the U.S. is itching with a war with Iran with nuclear weapons, they can't keep track of their own nuclear stockpile with a weapons-grade reactor found in Kodak's basement. The United States is quick to use the excuse of preventing the spread of nuclear materials to wage warfare, be it covert, economic, or military, against the likes of North Korea, Iran, and whoever is convenient to attack at the moment. But more and more evidence shows the U.S. is throwing stones from within a glass house. Kodak may be going under, but apparently they could have started their own nuclear war if they wanted just six years ago. Down in a basement in Rochester, New York, they had a reactor loaded with three and a half pounds of enriched uranium, the same kind they use in atomic warheads. But why did Kodak have a hidden nuclear reactor? And how did they get permission to own it, let alone install it in a basement of a mid- in the middle of a densely populated city? Nobody really knows. Kodak officials now admit that they never made any public announcement about it. In fact, nobody in the city, officials, police, or firemen, or the state of New York, or anywhere else, knew about it until it was recently leaked by an ex-employee. Its existence and whereabouts were purposely kept vague, and only a few engineers and federal employees really knew about the project. It's extremely strange that Kodak managed to get something like this. It's such an odd situation because private companies just don't have this material. While three and a half pounds of weapons-grade uranium is not enough to create a nuclear bomb, illegal arm merchants are seeking small amounts like this to put them for sale on the black market, which is why the United States has such a tight control on this material. The government doesn't want Iran or al-Qaeda getting their hands all over the atomic candy for obvious reasons. So I'm glad that's hitting the mainstream by you because people need to know about that. Yeah, and I mentioned to you last night that like, when Fukushima first happened, I uh, reached out to um, a retired employee that I didn't know, but I found him on um, one of the social networks, the business social networks, and Mm -hmm. he was one of their nuclear engineers. And I wanted to get in touch with someone because I had known that Kodak had one of those uh, half-million-dollar detectors up on their roof in the city. You know, and the EPA had shut everything down here, so we really were kind of flying blind. But um, he had told me some pretty interesting stories about when the U.S. first had started doing his nuclear testing. Um, Kodak had all their film 
in Rochester, and they were picking up anomalies on the film when the U.S. first started doing their secret nuclear testing from the fallout. And so Kodak had contacted somebody in the federal government and said, hey, what are you guys doing? Because we're picking you up over here. And that was how they got into bed with the feds over uh, the nuclear material. And from there, as to how they got the nuclear reactor in their basement, honestly, I don't know. But I might be able to find that out. Um, but, yeah, it, it, Kodak's um, facilities are right smack dab in the middle of the city. So it's pretty crazy. I mean, it's it's very densely populated. There's businesses all around there. And you go down about a mile. And, I mean, it's densely packed city housing. Yeah, that's interesting, too, about the film fogging up, because I ha- I had that happen when I first started working in a darkroom processing film. We had those big clocks, like the timers that had the radium dials, so you could see how long to keep the film in a pan mm-hmm. before you had to move it. And if you got the film too close to that clock, it would actually fog it, too. So they were noticing that from bomb fallout, too. Mm-hmm. It's pretty crazy. Um, another story, and this is going to be confirmed when we hear um, Michio Kaku's interview, seismologists predicting a major earthquake to hit Tokyo soon. This was published Sunday, May 13th. University of Tokyo seismologist Senshu Saikai has some very bad news for the human race. Saikai is a prominent Japanese seismologist who is predicting a major earthquake to hit Tokyo soon. He's seeing a 70% chance in or around Tokyo in the next four years. Government scientists have already proclaimed a similar risk, but over a longer time frame. When it comes to our nuclear future, this is bad news, for whenever the next major quake hits that general area, there is a high chance of building number four coming down and a fireball of spent nuclear fuel. After all, Japan is one of the most seismically active countries in the world. Although if you have been watching the quakes, there hasn't been much going on there. Recently, in fact, there hasn't been anything going on with quakes anywhere. It's been very quiet for almost a week now, which is a little concerning considering we have an a eclipse coming up next weekend. Sakai says there's been a five-fold increase in small tremors around Tokyo since the huge quake off Japan's northeast coast in March last year that destroyed Fukushima. This five-fold increase adds up to a mathematical omen for Sakai, who says with the help of the university's Earthquake Research Institute, crunched the new numbers and came up with a shocking prediction, a 70% chance a major earthquake will hit Tokyo within the next four years. And what Michio Kaku uh, was saying also is that the 9.0 quake actually destabilized the entire Pacific plate. And a lot of the earthquakes that they have now continuing there are actually still aftershocks from that large earthquake. We also heard from Christopher Busby this weekend, who was speaking at the Scientific and Citizen Forum on Radiation in Geneva, which we never got anybody to go to, unfortunately. That was held this weekend. We are living through the worst public health scandal in history. And he gave the comparison that 60 million develop cancer from nuclear weapons tests. And if you followed any of his work, he does not say anything without backing it up with meticulous research. I believe Arnie Gunderson may have spoke at this conference, too. There's, um, I wanted to play, actually, a portion of his interview, but the quality is kind of bad because he's in a large auditorium. So you can find that on any news, and I will post the link for you guys if you get a chance to listen to that today. I had an article come out on End the Lie this weekend, also called The Nuclear Industry in Fukushima, A Giant Nail in the Coffin of Humanity. If you didn't get a chance, check it out. We will be back with Nuked Radio. And we are back. One other thing I wanted to reiterate about the Chris Busby interview is he was trying to make a case for needing to get funding for researchers because he said a lot of the people that are doing independent research on this topic of the health effects from radiation are getting older and there aren't any new up-and-coming people to take over for them. And he said one of these days we might decide to just give it all up and go fishing. He talked about a glass barrier with the IAEA and the World Health Organization and how it prevents 
real information from getting out. And he was reiterating, too, that this is a scandal, worst public health scandal in history. The future of survival on Earth is at risk. Reuters actually ran an article also this weekend about the hole in Reactor 1. Uncertainty where radioactive water is leaking. That comes from the utility. Uh, This was published May 12th. One of the reactors of Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant has a hole in its main vessel following the meltdown of fuel rods leading to the leakage of radioactive water. Its operator said on Thursday, and we've known this for a while, but, you know, they're talking about building this wall underground which is a little concerning considering the precariousness of the spent fuel pool number four. If that's such a big issue, why are we messing around with building this wall underground? Well, I think we might have gotten our answer after listening to Michio Kaku this weekend. There were a couple other things, though, that I wanted to share, too, before we get to his interview. Um, Somebody posted this on the Radchick page this weekend. It was a Craigslist ad posted in Fresno. I was actually going to put this on WTF last night, Jules, but I forgot. Um, are they looking for TEPCO workers, I wonder? This was posted on May 11th. It's an ad for nuclear engineering, parentheses, willing to travel, looking for highly motivated young men and women that are willing to get paid to work on the most sophisticated nuclear power plants in the world. These are the requirements. You must be a U.S. citizen. You can't be older than 26. You must be willing to travel. You must be good at math. You must have a high school diploma and no criminal record. And must be comfortable with death. At the bottom, it says, if you meet the requirements, please call. Compensation is a $12,000 signing bonus and plenty of on-the-job training. Please no phone calls about the job. So it's just to call if you meet the requirements, but don't ask any questions. I thought only, like, basketball players make a $12,000 signing bonus. <laughs> well, Christina, you know, when the accident first happened, I have a friend that was working down at West Valley, which is the reprocessing plant in New York. Uh-huh. And when Fukushima first happened, they approached all of them and asked them if they would be willing to go to Japan to help with the accident. And they were offering them multiple times their yearly salary to go. And what was very odd about that is that they got a crew of guys ready to go, and then they turned around and they told them that they were no longer needed. And that was right at the same time when that Navy ship, you know, of all the specialists, the the radiation specialists was supposed to be coming up on the shore there, and they turned around and went home too. I've heard that they've been trying to recruit people out of schools, out of nuclear engineering schools to go to Japan and not telling them that that's where they're going, just offering them huge incentives. But, you know, the, the problem that they're running into is that we're, we're looking at 30 or 40 years if everything stays stable, if everything stays the way that it is right now for 40 years. Like the, the people that are working on site, the engineers, the really highly specialized staff, they've been at this a year, they're reaching their dosimeter limits And when they blow through those workers, who's going to replace them? And then when they blow through those workers, who's going to replace them? You know, you don't have a lot of people in this industry. And the thing is, with everything being cumulative, I mean, that's a lifetime dose you're looking at. Yeah, they they would be. It would be a lifetime dose, which is why they wouldn't be able to work on the site again. So, you know, there's going to be a real problem with keeping that place staffed. Another story that may or may not have anything to do with Fukushima fallout, but I thought it's worth mentioning. John Travolta flipped out again. Is flying through fallout affecting his brain? You know, he has his own plane, and he flies a lot, and lately he's been in the news a couple of times, once for grabbing a masseuse, which he's actually getting sued over. That came out about a week ago. Now, last week, he was at Disney World, and he took off his clothes and jumped in the uh, the moat surrounding It's a Small World, 
Oh, dear Lord. Yeah. Went swimming and then pulled down his underwear and, and urinated <laughs> in the pool. And um, the security had to kick him out of the park. And he was acting very strange. There, there was some uh, some comments that he made to the security personnel. I don't know what's going on with this guy, but you know he he does have a plane and he flies a lot. So I guess we'll just have to watch. Heads John up. Travolta. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Michio Kaku, he's got a book coming out called Physics of the Future: How Science Will Shape Human Destiny and Our Daily Lives by the Year Twenty One Hundred. Um, he was interview- interviewed on KPFA's Flashpoints. This was a May 9th broadcast. Just to give you a little background on him, he's an American theoretical physicist. He is a professor of theoretical physics in the City College of New York, the University of New York, <clears throat> and he's a co-founder of the string field theory. He's a very smart guy graduated from Harvard in 1968. He was first in his physics class. He attended the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, received his PhD in 1972. Jules, you were telling me something about him the other day. Yeah, I watched a biography with him. Um, Our federal government actually approached him and tried to get him into their weapons program, and he told them no. He refused to go. And his parents were in one of the Japanese internment camps in the U.S., when he and was he, a baby. Yeah, he was uh he was in there also as a child. Mm-hmm. And then and when they, when they got out, they offered him to be part of his uh their weapons program. They helped him through college. So I think that's why people sometimes think he's a shill. But I'll tell you, the few times that he's come out and actually opened his mouth, it's been as a warning. But then he's been shut up again, is mm-hmm. what my opinion is. Well, you know, when we have our government, too, if he if he does have any government involvement or is a shill, and I've heard that a bunch of times also, and I'm not sure that I believe it, but you have our government that's been saying all, all along, oh, Fukushima's fine, it's stable, there's nothing to worry about, and now we have all these people coming out saying this could end humanity as we know it. You know, is he being brought out to kind of ease us into this? Well, in March, when he was on CNN, he was the only one at the time even before Arnie, because Arnie's always been kind of conservative in his assessments. You know, I mean, now he's really kind of looking at it. But Arnie, Arnie was always very cautious about raising the red flags to, like, the ultimate danger. But Michio came on CNN, and I remember him talking about us going down the hillside at a 1,000 miles per hour, hanging by our fingernails. And that was how precarious the situation was. And, I mean, he did not sweet sugar top it. You know, he was pretty serious. When we come back, we'll listen to his interview. You're listening to Nuke Radio. Those of us who care about the future of the world and the dangers of nuclear weapons and uh, and uh, reactors are watching number four very closely. This comes out of natural news. The news you are about to read puts everything else in the category of insignificant by comparison. Concerned about 212 U.S. presidential election? Worried about GMOs? Fluoride? Vaccines? Secret prisons? None of that even matters if we don't solve the problem of Fukushima reactor number four, which is on the verge of a catastrophic failure that could unleash enough radiation to end human civilization on our planet. Dr. Michio Kaku, is this an exaggerating? Is this case being overstated? Uh, how would you assess the situation? People don't realize that the Fukushima reactor is on a knife's edge. It's near the tipping point. A small earthquake, another pipe break, uh, another explosion could tip it over, and we could have a disaster much worse, many times worse than Chernobyl. It's like a sleeping dragon. Now, just in the last few weeks, it's been in the papers, 
to some degree. Units 2, 3, and 4 have been shown to be in a very dire situation. Unit 2, we now know completely liquefied. We've never seen this before in the history of nuclear power, a 100% liquefaction of a uranium core. Unit Three, on the other hand, I'm unit four, on the other hand, has an even worse problem, and that is it's a spent fuel pond that is totally uncovered because of a hydrogen gas explosion that took place last year. There are 1,500 rods that could be exposed to the air and then set off another spent fuel pond with 6,000 rods. Altogether, there are 11,000 rods in the Fukushima site that could be tipped over, slight earthquake, a slight explosion could set the whole reactor back into motion. And also, uh, with regards to uh, Unit 3, we found there that we thought there was 33 feet of water above the core. We put a TV camera into Units 2 and 3. We now have TV pictures of the core. Unit 2, as I mentioned, is completely liquefied. Unit 3 does not have 33 feet of water on top of it. It has 2 feet of water two feet of water, not 33, meaning that the core is completely or partially uncovered, meaning it too could liquefy. So between units two, which is completely liquefied, unit three, which is totally exposed, and unit four, which has 1,500 spent fuel rods that in principle are exposed to the outside environment, we have a catastrophe in the making. Dr. Kakua, I became extremely alarmed. Uh, I guess it was about a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, when I saw a piece coming out of uh, Japanese uh, mainstream news sources that the head of the uh, power industry there uh, was withdrawing uh, their robots because it was too hot for the robots. And essentially, they were saying they need to invent new technology to deal with what, a situation they never dealt with before? That's exactly right. Uh, a lot of information is coming out. First of all, information is not coming out that the utility was contemplating evacuating all of Tokyo at the height of the nuclear power accident. Can you imagine evacuating 30 million people, evacuating something like 20% of all the Japanese people being evacuated at the height of the crisis? It was totally suppressed at that time. Now you mentioned the fact that, A, it's so radioactive that humans cannot come close to certain parts of the reactor sites, and even robots get fried. Their delicate machinery, their microcircuitry cannot withstand the intense bombardment of radiation. We're talking about thousands of rads of radiation per hour being registered there, and that is affecting the cleanup operation. They said they're in a stable situation. Stable in the sense that they're hanging by their fingernails, and if their fingernails begin to crack, then of course you go over so that's how dire the situation is and again it's not making the media because it is quote stable but it's stable only in the sense that they're hanging in there by their fingernails and when they admit that they have to invent technology how, how long does it uh, take to invent this technology it takes years because you're talking about the circuitry being fried by all this radiation. Radiation causes ionization. It rips atoms apart. These ions, in turn, are electrically charged. They can short circuit. They can degrade the delicate microcircuitry that are found in robots. So we think that robots are invulnerable because they're made out of steel. No, they have chips in them. They have sensors in them. And these chips and sensors are very sensitive to radiation. And it would take years years to invent a new generation of robots that can withstand radiation at that level. You realize that the workers that go in, in some sense, are like samurai warriors. They're like suicide workers. They know they're getting huge amounts of radiation going to the site. They can only go in seconds to minutes at a time doing work, and then the next batch has to come in. By the way, at the Chernobyl accident, uh, they had a half a million workers help clean up that accident, each worker going in for a few minutes at a time. Gorbachev gave medals to a half a million people to clean up that Chernobyl. Here we have a situation potentially much worse than Chernobyl simply because we have basically five reactors that could go up, one reactor setting off the next reactor. That's in a huge amount of radiation, uh, over 10 times the radiation inventory found in, in Chernobyl. Now, uh, Dr. Kaku, I don't know where you're sitting now. I'm sitting in a studio down the block from your alma mater, uh, University of California at Berkeley. Uh, we are sort of uh, the closest U.S. Uh, m m generally speaking, we are the sort of on the edge facing Japan and Hawaii. Uh, 
what will this look like if things get worse? If the we have the worst and there is this uh, meltdown and release, what, what what will we see? Well, first of all, the earthquake damage is a possibility is real. The number of earthquakes has gone up dramatically in Japan, and in fact, in Japan, it's been front page news last month that there's a seventy percent chance of another gigantic tsunami hitting Japan in the next ten years. Seventy percent chance that southern Japan. Japan this time, not northern Japan. Southern Japan could be hit by a gigantic tsunami, given the fact that the number of small earthquakes has dramatically risen. So the Fukushima uh, earthquake probably loosened the whole Pacific plate, meaning that the rest of the country could possibly be devastated by a gigantic tsunami. Now, most of the damage, if there is a secondary earthquake, would be in Japan. However, the winds will carry it uh, every which way. And in fact, even in the Chernobyl, even in the Fukushima accident, we saw some of the radiation travel over the Pacific. And in fact, radiation counters in Colorado, in California, in Seattle, showed slightly elevated amounts of radiation from Fukushima. Now, to put this into perspective, if all 11,000 rods were to go up in smoke, now that's probably not going to happen, but if all 11,000 rods were to go into the atmosphere, the accumulated radiation inventory, mainly of cesium-137, would be about 50% of the entire amount of radiation released if you conclude all nuclear tests, all nuclear tests of the Soviet Union and the United States combined, 50% of that would be equivalent to a total, total collapse at Fukushima. All right. Uh, we're watching this very closely, Dr. Kaku, and uh, we're always uh, appreciative of the information uh, that you bring to us. Uh, an assessment, we hear a lot about uh, U.S. reactors being different, uh, that this kind of thing would not happen uh, in the United States, uh, that there shouldn't be the kind of concern uh, that we're uh, seeing and expressing about uh, Fukushima. Well, yes and no. First of all, President Obama is trying to get licensed the next generation of nuclear power plants. The next generation of nuclear power plants are called, quote, inherently safe in the sense that they use gravity, gravity to bring down the rods. So gravity, instead of working against you, works with you. But you see, to me, this is kind of cosmetic. It's like putting makeup on a very dangerous situation because the accident still progresses. It does melt down. It doesn't melt down in two hours like a normal reactor would. It melts down perhaps in a day, but it does melt. And the waste is enormous. You're talking about 30 tons of high-level nuclear waste coming out from each reactor per year. And so uh, we're putting a cosmetic face, basically old wine in new bottles and trying to market the next generation of nuclear power plants. Is it true that there are some kinds of uh, contingency plans to evacuate Tokyo, to evacuate Japan? Well, we now know that during the secret uh, conversations between TEPCO, the utility, and the Japanese government that they were opening up. Uh, they were opening up these secret files where they would evacuate Tokyo uh, with three times the population of greater New York City. Uh, and, uh, of course, that would be impossible. You can't even evacuate Tokyo on a nice day when traffic moves relatively smoothly. review what he was saying and for anyone who thought that any of the claims about the spent fuel pool or the Fukushima site some of these scenarios were being sensationalized or exaggerated when the co-founder of string theory is worried about it I think we should be worried about it too he said in that interview that there's a hole in number one there's liquefaction of the nuclear material, there's instability in four, and at one point he was talking about reactor three also, and he said there should be 33 feet of water over the core. Instead, there's only two feet, and then later he said that it was completely uncovered. He also confirmed the 70% 70, 70 chance of another tsunami, a large earthquake. We have to remember, physicists don't really know 
how corium reacts. Melted corium has only been observed in very, very tiny amounts in labs. What they think happens when corium goes down into the ground is it starts to pick up dirt and rock and other stuff, which basically mixes in with it. It develops kind of a shell, almost like a glass crust over the top and bottom. But that was when it would be in its lava state. Molten lava is about 700 to 1300 degrees Celsius. But he's talking about uranium. The melting point of uranium is 2865 degrees Celsius or 5189 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. So I'll let you think about that for a second. This was published in Business Insider. On March 12th of 2011, what is a nuclear meltdown? A nuclear meltdown is an informal term for a severe nuclear reactor accident that results in core damage from overheating. This term is not recognized by the IAEA or the U.S. NRC. A meltdown occurs when a severe failure of a nuclear power plant system prevents proper cooling of the reactor core to the extent that the nuclear fuel assemblies overheat and melt. A meltdown is considered very serious because of the potential that radioactive materials could be released into the environment. A core meltdown will also render the reactor unusable until and unless it is repaired. When the cooling doesn't work, the emergency cooling system doesn't kick in. It's supposed to work, but it must pump in lots of cool water continuously over a long period. Remember, the reactor vessel and the fuel elements are extremely hot. They have a huge, huge heat capacity that the system is trying to overcome. The water from the system will be turning to steam from almost the moment it enters the vessel and hits the core. And that's when it's like 2,000 degrees. The centerline temperatures in the fuel are climbing. Soon the centerline temperatures of the fuel cause the metals to begin to liquefy. Heat is still being generated. More melting occurs. The cladding melts. The fuel is now exposed to the steam in the core. Highly radioactive materials are carried out of the hole in the primary plumbing into the area inside the emergency containment structure. That is what led to the explosions of the reactors, but for the most part from a buildup of hydrogen from that cladding melting. Molten fuel and fuel byproducts, the latter being incredibly radioactive, begin running down inside the core, and a puddle of this forms at the bottom of the reactor vessel. Now the problem is in the Mark I design, the holes are in the bottom of the vessel that the control rods get inserted into. It's basically like a spaghetti strainer. So if it melts, it just runs out the bottom. Should the magnitude of the failure be over the top, the puddle will melt its way through the bottom of the pressure vessel, through the bottom of the concrete floor of the reactor facility, and into the earth. Hence the name China Syndrome. But in the case of Fukushima, it's actually called Argentina Syndrome because that would be the antipode to Japan. We engineered to avoid this, but it can't happen, not a good thing. And Corium, when it was observed in Chernobyl, and in part of this interview with Michio Kaku, he said that the fuel at Chernobyl is still melting down. And I put a link in chat about that. He didn't expound on it very much. Composition of Corium depends on the type of reactor, specifically on the materials used in the control rods and the coolant. During a meltdown, the temperature of the fuel rods increase, they begin deforming. And in Chernobyl, they actually witnessed three different types of corium forming, brown, black, and yellow. Each one of those had its own specific properties. And that's really all the basis of understanding we have that Three Mile Island of what corium does when it leaves the reactor. So now... Based on what Michio Kaku is saying, this liquid uranium is almost as hot as the sun. I would imagine that that is going to cut through the matter of the earth pretty easily. If it's liquid, it's going to be able to get into faults and cracks and things in the ground a lot easier than if it was lava or if it had some kind of glass crust that was forming on it. So this is very concerning new information on top of the information that we already had before. 
plasma is a state of matter similar to gas in which certain portions of the particles are ionized, ionized, sorry, heating a gas may ionize its molecules or atoms. A good example of this would be a plasma lamp or the sun. So there's not a whole lot we can do about this information except reiterate how important it is for people to be protecting their health. And that leads me to another article that was released this weekend um, that was emailed to me and posted on my page. Um, it's asked if you reprint this or if you post it, you post it in its entirety. This is from an orthomolecular medicine news service. This could be another one of the most important pieces of news that we've gotten over the last few days. This is by Steve Hickey, PhD, Atso Yangaksawa, MD, PhD, Andrew Saul, PhD, Gert Schudemaker, PhD, and Damian Downing, MD. People have been misinformed about the tragedy at Fukushima and its consequences. There's a continuing cover up. The reactors have not been stabilized. The radiation continues to be released. The Japanese College of Intravenous Therapy has recently released a video for people wishing to learn more about how to protect themselves from contamination by taking large doses of vitamin C. Now, this information was shared with the Japanese government, so it could share it with its people and with the workers at TEPCO, but they have basically ignored it. In the fall of 2011, this intravenous college of Japan presented a study that Fukushima workers had abnormality gene expression, which may be avoided using dietary antioxidants, especially vitamin C. The data was presented in Japan, Taiwan, and Korea sent letters to the government urging the government to tell the people how to protect themselves to date the recommendation has been ignored by the Japanese government and TEPCO. Linus Pauling gained the Nobel Peace Prize in part based on his calculations of the number of deaths from nuclear weapons fallout. He was supported by physicist and father of the Soviet bomb, Andrei Shurhagov, who later received the Nobel Prize for Peace. These and other scientists estimated there would be an extra 10,000 deaths worldwide for each megaton nuclear test in the atmosphere. A nuclear reactor can contain much more radioactive material than a nuclear weapon. Fukushima has six reactors plus stored additional radioactive materials and nuclear waste. Forty years of it, actually. How radiation damages cells. Ionizing radiation acts to damage living tissue by forming free radicals. Essentially, electrons are ripping from molecules. Removing an electron from an atom or molecule turns it into an ion, hence the term ionizing radiation. X-rays, gamma rays, alpha and beta radiation are all ionizing. Most of this damage occurs from generating free radicals in water, as water molecules are by far the most abundant in the body. How do antioxidants work? Free radical scavengers, as the name suggests, mop up the damaging radicals produced by radiation. Why vitamin C? It's of particular importance and should be included at high intakes for anyone trying to minimize radiation poisoning. They're recommending 3,000 milligrams taken four times a day for a total of 12,000 milligrams. I'll put this article in chat and I'll post it on Ratchik and Fukushima Facts. Please read it in its entirety. We will be back on Thursday. Thanks for listening today. Thank you, Kurt and Jules. You're very welcome. Thanks, Christine. Everyone stay safe.